So welcome to Legal Awareness Web Series. Uh, today we have uh, India's tallest law professor, uh, Professor Amit Adhanda. Uh, he is a well-known name in legal circles. Uh, hardly anyone today uh, within the national law universities can match her research contribution. Uh, she is a teacher par excellence, uh, did her PhD under India's only legal philosopher, Professor Upendra Bakshi. Uh, students on her retirement uh, have made a website, let us problematize. And I think they have uh, accurately described Professor Dhanda because the students are our best judge. And this is the highest reward which any teacher can dream of. Uh, the kind of appreciation which students who are no more under her control in terms of uh, marks or projects uh, have said all kinds of uh, good things. Uh, I had read some of her articles, but when I came to Nalsar in 2012 and I was holding my first meeting uh, uh, with teachers and non-teaching staff, uh, she was not present, but then uh, I saw that she was uh, going towards her office and then I went out and brought her uh, to the meeting and thereafter we had a very, very close uh, relationship. So Siddhanda joined Indian Law Institute as researcher in 1984, uh, same year when you had Delhi riots. And then in 1986, uh, she joined Chief Justice P.N. Bhagwati uh, as the judicial clerk. So let me ask you, Professor Dhanda, how was your experience uh, in the Supreme Court? What was the judicial culture then? Uh, what is the judicial culture today? Why many people feel that Indian judiciary of today uh, is not as independent or as assertive as it used to be? Well, uh, as far as judicial culture is concerned, you know, um, I suppose I did work with one of the best judges and uh, how good he was as a judge is something we realize, at least I realize over a course of time that, you know, you, you were having a discussion on a specific case and then you kind of, you're required to do research, you provide the research and then the judge gets busy in something else. And then weeks later or months later, sometimes you meet him. And he can pick up the argument from exactly where you had left it out, you know, to connect it up and say, yes, but I think that idea is the one which ties up with what I want to do here. And it was like quite amazing for me. You know, it's like this because I know that law clerks sometimes believe that because they have done a, pop, a body of research and some of it finds place in a judgment that maybe they have done something marvelous. What they don't realize is this, that the judge has got a problem before and how that research is getting tailored and customized into a situation is, it was for me quite an amazing experience. And, and the fact of small, small things, which I found, you know, uh, because uh, when I joined as a judicial clerk, the Supreme Court did not have an institutionalized system like it has today. So necessarily, you know, like whether it was the relationship with the registry, whether it was access to the court or access to the chief justice, these were first principles that we created. Uh, Mulchan Sharma was the other law clerk with me. Uh, and so the two of us were there, but it was like, you know, like we had a designated space in the court, in courtroom number one, the kind of, uh, we also created a lot of upset in the registry. There's no, no two opinions on that count. But all in all, I found it, I mean, that first-hand exposure. To take to the second part of your question, uh, you know, one of the things which Professor Mustafa, for me, was like, when you saw it firsthand, was the extent of feudalism which exists, subsists in everyday practice in the judiciary. You know, you just cannot believe it like that if a judge is walking on the corridor, nobody else can walk with them. They're supposed to like you do it for royalty. You're supposed to flatten yourself against the wall. And, you know, the human beings are kind of 
treated like they are part of stone and mortar. They are not humans. Uh, small things you notice, you know, you go to court that somebody has to like, they can't, you just can't get up on your own. Someone has to push your chair back. All the small, 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 because I, I definitely do think I'm a great believer in the norms of everyday practice. And when you have so much of feudalism and so much of unquestioning kind of uh, deference being given to you, you're not used to being challenged. And those were judges who were really scholars. They were tall people in several, several sorts of ways. And yet, you know, with that kind of culture, you, you don't, you're not used to being questioned. In today's time, I definitely, I'm not a great believer. I'm not, I, I'm not uh, very enamored by the collegium. I somewhere do feel that um, when you are doing your own set of appointments and you don't have any other oversight, then somewhere we have created a culture of conformity and conformity for any institution for its own sake is never good. You must always have a dissent coming in, you know, dissent, and you must create a culture of dissent. And I somewhere feel that that culture of dissent still subsisted when, when I had gone there and when you, when the judiciary was not doing its own appointments, what you have had now, is I somewhere feel is that you, you are asking for conforming judges. And I'm sorry to say, and maybe I'm sticking my neck out, but that's been my lifetime career, that I feel that it's conformity rather than competence, which is getting people into the apex court. And, and you're getting much, much better judges in, in the high courts and possibly even in the first courts, because we are asking for too much obedience. Right. So you were also there in the Supreme Court Commission, which investigated conditions of uh, persons who were suffering from mental illness yes. in West Bengal jails. So what did you find there? Because uh, mental health law is a subject of uh, your interest. We will have some other questions also. Are we any better now in terms of our uh, you know, reaction to mental health issues? Well, I can answer this in two, three kinds of ways. One is that, yes, at one level, uh, there is much more awareness in the sense of that uh, for certain kinds of disturbances or tensions or even disorders, I would say, we are way more receptive. And a certain level of kindness is also extended. You also recognize the fact that certain kinds of conditions could have adverse effects on mental health. And consequently, you're willing to accommodate it. I mean, you, you're aware of how much of that we've been able to do in Nalsar. And people can come forward and say that, yes, I require this or that support because it is anti my mental health. So to that extent, some level of everyday conversation has become possible on mental health. I will say that. Uh, even in terms of institutional conditions, um, you can say that, you know, the, like the rank, horrible kind of conditions may be somewhat marginally better. But the sad part of it is that even today, when it comes to providing for support services, when you require that people need help, the only thing that you can think of providing is to send off people into institutions. I mean, the best of people with the, the most you know, amazing kind of financial and connection resources, when they are troubled by a family member, the only thing they can think of doing is that, all right, then if we can't handle this at home, you will have to be put away in an institution. We've not really been able to create a culture of... Uh, extending solidarity and support within communities so that, you know, even if I have, I'm not feeling great on a particular day or time, I can live with my family, I can live with my colleagues, I can continue to do as much as I can do. That we have, we are still a long way to go. But right. That we have done nothing, I can't say that. I, I mean, I, I've been working in the field for 40 plus years and I can say this to you that, there are lots and lots of initiatives which exist today, which did not exist earlier. We have moved, but whether this is sufficient, I can't say. I don't, I don't really think so. 
Okay, tell me something about uh, your PhD in a big traditional university like Delhi University. The doctoral candidates don't have a choice in selecting their guide. So how uh, you got Professor Bakshi as your guide and how you selected your uh, PhD topic? First, tell you how I selected my PhD topic. Yeah. And it's also like logical coming in from the previous question you'd asked me. Uh, I lost my father when I was 18. Uh, so, um, and you know, like somewhere at that point of time, you, you, you're given this kind of constant counseling that you must have a stiff upper lip. You must, you know, like this is a difficult time, but you shouldn't. So the kind of grieving and the kind of crying and the other things that one should have been doing, I did not do. And it hit me a couple of years later and I had what you would call as a, you know, a proper breakdown. And I couldn't sort of like, you know, and, and it was just that I had a very supportive family. People understood what was happening. I came out of it. It's not like, you know, and it was just a, it's a one-time episode. And the reason why I'm speaking about it is because I want to sort of say to you that distress and suffering and all of these things are common to everybody's life and anyone can go through these phases. So I had that experience. I came out of it. I, in fact, you know, I, I, it's a very interesting, uh, very a side point. But maybe some of my students would find it interesting that in my this is the episode happened when I was in the first year of law. I mean, it's a, it's a couple of years after my father passed away, but it's like one of those things where you repress and then suddenly it comes out in a way which you didn't expect it to. And I missed all my five uh, papers my LLB five pay first first semester papers without which means that I had to clear all the next five. And it was the only year wherein the uh, Delhi University decided to do away with the supplementary system and saying that you will give your, you know, your repeat papers along with whatever your papers are for that. And I actually went and did all my papers together at that point of time. So Instead all in all, it was you like had to appear in 10 papers. Yes, instead of five, I had to appear in 10 because that was the, I think I, and they did away. Then, of course, there was a strike and the supplementary system got restored. But I was somebody who fell within the cracks and went and did those nine or 10 papers and can speak to the fact of that, yes, it was very distressful. It was not, not the thing to do that you're having an exam every day kind of stuff. The, the, so that particular episode of mine, uh, was I mean, it wasn't like public knowledge, but it was more that close friends knew that I had a very difficult time. So when I did started to do my master's, I had a close friend who suggested to me that, you know, considering this is something you have experienced, why don't you do your LLM dissertation on this? And I did my LLM dissertation on compulsory commitment to mental hospitals, which is an area of where law and mental health interact, you know, because you can't be sending somebody to, to a mental hospital without the authority of law because Article 21 of the Constitution for us, or even otherwise, it's a requirement that you just cannot put somebody off, you know, you have to follow the fair process kind of thing. So I did that as my LLM dissertation. And I had uh, Professor Kelkar as my guide for that dissertation. So because I did it for my LLM, it was a logical thing that I expand that area for my PhD. And I was again given Professor Kelker only as my guide. And I had a, you know, like, it was a very different relationship to my relationship with uh, Professor Bakshi. But I had a very robust relationship with Professor Kelker too. And he was a really a towering figure in the whole area of criminal law. Also, actually, I studied at the Delhi University at that time where you had virtually every major scholar in the country in the faculty of law and Delhi. So it was like we were spoiled for choice. And if anybody asks me, how did you choose your LLM subjects? I chose them according to teacher. I didn't choose according to subjects. It was like, okay, fine. You know, if I'm going to have uh, Sivaramaya teach me family law, then I'll take family law. And if I'm going to have uh, you know, D.K. Singh teach me constitutional law, I'll take constitutional law. I mean, I worked on that basis. I didn't really choose a specialization. I chose teachers. I just decided an LLM is too early to specialize. So uh, I got 
Professor Kelkar as my guide for my uh, yes. PhD. Yes, and then Professor Kelkar kind of uh, got cancer and he died. Oh. So after he died, all his students, Ved Kumari was also his student, uh, you know, for her juvenile justice system. I was my, his student for my law and mental health thing. All his students were transferred to Professor uh, Bakshi offered to take all his students. And that's how I got Professor Bakshi. Okay, it was like a, one of those happy, uh, unhappy reason, but happy coincidence. Correct, correct, correct. I didn't choose him. It was like given to him. Also, he was the only one who was comfortable taking the area. Uh, one other small connection is because Professor Bakshi had in his Law and Society course introduced on the suggestion when, you know, like he used to do this business of that where you, he would share a curriculum and then he would ask students, do you want something else added? So I had suggested to him, why don't we do insanity? And so he had a whole module added on insanity, ideology, and social control. I did the term paper for it, and then I did my dissertation. So there was this connection that he, he knew the area, he knew me, and was willing to sort of do the further guide. Now we will return to in insanity because you have written so much on that. But tell us something about your interest in disability law. Uh, of course, you prepared the country report and then prepared the draft bill. Then you were frustrated when UPA towards the uh, close of their term uh, tried to introduce uh, uh, this uh, down, yeah. disability bill. Now, subsequently, the current government enacted it, with, which is an improvement on what UPA had proposed. And then you tried to further improve it through rules. So tell, tell us something about your interest in disability law. And you, at Nalsar, you had set up a state of art disability. disability so yes. awesome. yeah. Okay, so my interest in disability actually just came logically from my interest in mental health. See, the thing is that mental health was also one of the most excluded uh, areas of, uh, of law. I mean, not as such. I mean, it's it, before I came in, you know, you literally had one very major article on the insanity defense in the Journal of Indian Law Institute as amongst the major contributions happening in the area. And I was like, literally, it was because as a law person, somebody who's engaging with this area, I was like in a huge minority. And at a very, very young age, given a kind of a pioneering status. So I got opportunities also of various kinds, uh, you know, much earlier than usually people would get because I was the only one doing it and possibly not doing too bad a job. So the combination helped. I mean, the Supreme Court had uh, nominated me as a commissioner for that West Bengal uh, commission when I was still an assistant professor, you know, which is like not usually done. But it was more to do with the fact of that she knows the area. So the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, on a similar kind of logic, had nominated me to chair a committee to amend the earlier act, the 1995 act. Yeah. And it was very um, interesting, uh, Professor Mustafa, that I was, you know, I have, I have had both sorts of situations. So I was the chair of the committee and the youngest member in that whole group. You know, it's like, so I had really tarring people as members people who'd like spend their lifetime working in the field, but they were working in the field of disability. Their thing somewhere was that we want to amend a legislation, so we need to have a law person. Looking around, they couldn't find the law person who has worked to the extent to which I have. So that opportunity came my way. And we did this large scale consultation across the length and breadth of the country and did it in a very participative manner, which held me good when we were doing the, as the Center for Disability Studies, we were the legal consultants to the committee, again, set up by the Ministry of Social Justice. They had nominated me and the center to be the legal consultants to the committee saying that we don't have law people. So it was basically that kind of combination. Of course, by now, by the 216 Act, they, there were many more people who had started to work, even in law. But when I first did the work, I was the only one who was working in this area. And I think, uh, like I said to you, this combination of that, I was the only one. And then I was found to be 
kind of decent. So that two combinations worked on my getting deeper and deeper into the field. Okay. And uh, yeah. yeah. So completed. Sorry. <laughs> completed. No, I was just sort of saying that, you know, that when this one, I just wanted to make this connection because I think it's an important connection somewhere that when I came to uh, do this work with the committee, again, this whole question of participation of the people and to, you know, like the, the 2016, I mean, the, the version which we did, which was the 2012 version, was consulted through the length and breadth of the country and in the only time in the language of the people. It was not consulted in English. It was translated into the local language and then consulted. And as a result of which, Professor Mustafa, you were part uh, with me when, when we got that horrible legislation coming in from the UPA government. The reason why we were able to make that kind of a dent and were not, that the UPA government could not go ahead with what it wanted to do was because everybody knew the 2012 legislation. You had educated the whole country on it. So the moment you said that that legislation is not coming, something else is coming, everybody rose up in arms. If supposing we had done it as a closed door exercise and not shared it with people, they wouldn't understand what we are protesting about. Correct. And that was the time when you persuaded me to resume writing for newspapers because I had to stop yes, writing yes. for newspapers. So, no, I, uh, I mean, I, I, your, your contribution there, and I'm so glad. If you want to give me credit for it, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> I'm absolutely happy to take it because both the channel as well as your newspaper writing have done something which I think all of us as law people really seriously need to look at. We say ignorance of law is no excuse. And yet, what do we do to make people knowledgeable about the law? Correct. You know, it's important to be asking that question also. And that's the reason why I think that, and I'm not just saying, I mean, I'm saying that you're opening it up for other people because somebody has to start doing it for other people to understand that this is worth doing. Right. And so, not to do it in legalese, but in everyday language, which people understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now let us come to your teaching career. Uh, of course, I will uh, ask you questions about Nal, sir. But if my memory is not failing me, uh, I think uh, uh, you also proposed to join uh, National Law School of India University, Bangalore, and then decided against. Uh, so, uh, what was this story? <laughs> what was this story? <laughs> the story was a because what was Bangalore's loss is. Purely, you know, absolutely null sir's game. I'm so grateful to you that you didn't join them and join us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I suppose I always say, Professor Mustafa, I mean, ki, you know, if you want to tender someone, then you want to be my CV. This is not true because in number of search committees, I was there. I tried to persuade you to accept vice chancellorship. That is much later. That's much but, later. But, but by then, I already had the. I already it's had not the tender. another tender. Your CV is not another tender. <laughs> okay. Anyway, see what happened was that uh, National School. I was assistant professor at Indian Law Institute, and National School advertised for associate professors and stuff. So because our promotions at the Law Institute had been dragging feet for years together, and I think I reached a point where I got fed up. So I had applied for uh, this position. And once we got it, and I did a demonstration class, I mean, the class went very well and all of that. So when the interview happened, the interview also went very well. But what, uh, what, was, what happened basically was that instead of giving me the associate professor's position for which I had at, applied, I was offered a senior assistant professor's position, which they said was in terms of money and all that would be a big gain and that kind of thing. I was, I'm always been a, you know, like one of those people who um, is maybe in some things not very flexible. So my thing somewhere was that, no, you had applied, you had asked me to apply for an associate professor's position. Either you find me good for it or you don't find me good for it. So if you find me good for it, then you have to give me an associate professor's position. They offered me a senior assistant, which I refused. So nobody was told this inner story and the whole world was told that, oh, because I had my class went so well that they couldn't believe it that I was not being hired. 
So the story that was put out was that, oh, she refused. But what she refused, nobody was told. Okay. You have stories about yourself. When I was coming to Nalsar, a number of people told me, you know, Professor Dhanda is there. Just take care. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so uh, you are Professor Ranbir Singh's greatest gift to Nalsar. Tell us something about how an offer was made to you and how are early days at Nalsar. Okay, I was say this. Some of the people who are in the uh, in the the original trust, the the founding members of Nalsar. Nalsar Society. The offer came to yeah, yeah, society. The offer came to me from them. They wanted me to come here and appear for an interview. I was interviewed by uh, Justice Venkat Ram Reddy and Justice Parvata Rao, and you know that entire uh, the seniors of this uh, this university's. Founding. So the founders. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they interviewed me. They found me good and they kind of asked me to join. And at that point of time, I just took a uh, kind of an extraordinary leave from Indian Law Institute and I came. It is subsequently that and uh, within a couple of months of my joining, I was also asked to assume the position of registrar. And I was like made um, professor come acting registrar. And it was like until further orders kind of an order. It was, it didn't give me any security of tenure or anything of that sort. It just made me, gave me that position. And uh, it was said that, oh my God, you know, we don't have so much work. So hence, uh, we don't really need a full-time registrar, which is true or not true. I can't say, but I know for a fact that I literally didn't have a moment to myself. I was doing a full uh, but like you know, full, full workload of teaching, and I was registrar, and I was you can say everything else also rolled into one. You know, like you don't have a dean of student welfare, you don't have this thing, so you do everything because somebody has to be doing those things. You know, sort of. So that's how I started my career at Nalsa, and it started also like because I, when I first came in here, we were in the Barkatpura, you know, building. And whilst we were in the second year or something, we came to the campus. And it's like we came to the campus with the, with the frogs and the insects and the snakes and lots of other, you know, like all the other natural creatures whom we were displacing were there with us sort of things. And evidently, you know, like the, the kind of facilities we have now on campus, it was nothing like that. You know, it was like, literally speaking, you had to come right virtually into the city. If you wanted even to shop for, you know, the max, you could say you could go to the Raitu Bazaar and do some vegetable shopping. But even that wasn't a particularly great thing. So you literally landed up right in Karkhana. That was the way it was to happen for any kind of, and it was a, it was a big struggle. Also, uh, because it was early days, so it, I, I have experiences of that you've just sat down to eat and you have a bell ringing and a student has come with a, you know, like a plate of food from the canteen and saying, this is what they're giving us to eat. And, you know, like you, you're supposed to, at that point itself, like do something or the other and all. So it was a, it was chaotic times. Uh, we did our classes in the first instance in the hostels, you know, because the, the academic block had not been built. So the common rooms were used as classrooms. And you all of us... Like, as bedroom, something like that. <laughs> That's what people it was a, it, it was like, yeah, it was... Uh, and after dinner or so, you know, people will use it for sleeping. I mean, that's what I'm saying is that it's, it's like a... It was... Very, very tight times, but I suppose it also had all the zealousness of a, you know, an institution which has just come right. and which doesn't want to be just a prototype of National Law School Bangalore. That was also a very, very, very uh, kind of, let's say, I won't say uh, it was a driving force, but it was a, in, it, its own vision. Like we decided we don't want a trimester. It was a decision that we didn't want a trimester. See, when Bhopal kind of went in, in to a large extent, uh, what did exactly the sort of things which were happening in Bangalore happened in Bhopal. We did a very, we, we did a very decided thing. And it wasn't like, you know, if they are doing, we won't do. You gave tenures to the teachers. In we, we gave tenures to the teachers. We gave, 
No, because we we see, and we also gave a preference to people from within the region. The logic was basically this: that it's a law school coming within the region. The people from within the region have the greatest stake, and that's why you have a large amount of faculty at Nansar who came right from the start. You know, who don't have so much. You also, in fact, because Professor Balak is the lady. Was in J uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He was brought back to Nalsar on this rationale that if he comes back to his own region, he will have a greater stake to be in here than somebody who's. It's not like we don't have people from other other parts of the country, but it was also this that you know all things being equal, we did think so that I think the similar thing in Odisha. Because local mm -hmm. people will stay back and they will sustain the institution. But yeah, that is the logic with which. which uh, which how different it is for a woman to be a professor in Indian universities in general and in NLU's in particular. You want me to stick my neck out? Freedom. I would some freedom of. I know, and I, I, I have no issues about saying it because see the thing is. Uh, thankfully for me, one, you are doing this to me just a couple of days before I have to retire as full professor at NALSA. And also, I suppose uh, somewhere I have, I have lived my life on speaking out my mind all the time. So I'm not going to desist at this point. I will say the same to you, Professor Mustafa, and I'm sort of, uh, it's my view that people find it very difficult to deal not just with a woman, but with a competent woman. With a woman who has a mind of her own, who's not going to be just told off, who has, you know, who's going to be drawing lines. That is difficult. If you are a, if you are a pliant, compliant woman, if you are sort of doing, towing the line and doing without threatening anybody else, that kind of a woman professor or that kind of a woman faculty can get along. But if you are not that kind, you're saying I'm a professor, I'm not a woman professor, I'm a professor who's also a woman who's a feminist who could be all of those things. I'm not saying that. It's a very, very different thing. I also have this other theory where I feel and this is like not just being as a woman, but I would say even as a scholar, as a professor, I find that if you have institutions being headed by insecure people, not very competent people, people who just want a lot of affirmation for what they are doing, then you definitely can't have a competent woman either being a professor and national law schools, if it's worse. The, like why I'm saying it's worse is because it's not really larger than even a big college. It's smaller than a big college. Correct. Everybody knows everybody. You can't do a darn thing there without, you know, someone going and reporting it, okay, this is what is happening. And if you are an insecure head of the institution, you don't allow for people to just flourish. It, it is so very important that you should be having institutions headed by real scholars, which is how vice chancellors were earlier chosen. Increasingly, we have started choosing administrators, we have started choosing people who are, again, you know, like I was saying about the Supreme Court, who are conformists, who don't threaten people, who will oblige. Necessarily, it's, it's for a person like me, I would say it was, it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult. It's a different thing that one did not back down is, is, a, is my story. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with that the environment was conducive. And it's here that I would somewhere, and it's no compliment as such. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just saying this to you that for me, the last seven, eight years at Nalsar have been a very different experience. And I'm so grateful and thankful that I've had that experience. And I, and I had that experience only after you came. It's a truth. You know, I'm, it's, it's like, um, and I'm not saying I'm some, you know, great shakes. It's, it's more like a fact of that. When you are garnering mediocrity, you're literally garnering mediocrity, then you're going to have anybody who's even a trifle better than mediocre becomes threatening. And if that person happens to be a woman, God help her. <laughs> it's, it's that combination, you know.
So what and you you just you, you yourself say you know like how many vice chancellors do we take on the fact of that this is the best person we have and how many do we take because okay this person is somebody who is pliable if pliability becomes a criteria you can't get good heads of institutions but then it's the human nature you would never like to have your number 2 or number 3 uh who can challenge you why psychologically psychology but this is the thing someone is how how are you going to know that what you are doing is correct or not correct that's right that's if right if you have nobody who if you have nobody who can tell you that this is not the best thing that you could have done then literally speaking you are only dependent on yourself right and all of us are human even in terms of making errors no right right you're right absolutely right so professor dhanda tell me you are someone who came to teaching from research our teachers used to say that uh, a university teacher has to do teaching which is the primary duty and can also do little bit of research so what is your teaching philosophy and what is your message to the new law teachers today i teach like a researcher mm mm-hmm. i i say that all the time i teach like a researcher for me uh, every new subject i take up and every new batch i in, engage with every new subject means that you understand that subject to the best possible and every new batch means that you don't come with the same standard form technique you look at what this batch is like what makes it tick what would work with them what will not work with them and consequently like say i'll tell you the most recent experience we've had uh if you've ever heard anything about my teaching i am not supposed to be some great lecture giver i am my my classes are hugely hugely interactive and most of the time it goes on in not i won't say whether socratic or not but a very very interactive class which is going on in a dialogic method you know like you constantly there's a back and forth happening between the students and me and there would be maybe like small nuggets which would come as lectures at certain points of time as an explanatory after a lot of discussion has happened that's the way in which i used to teach till the online thing happened when i started to do the online i realized professor mustafa that if i try to do it in this manner uh one everybody doesn't have the same connectivity two like certain times in in that kind of a setup students were feeling pressured on so many other counts i did not want them to feel that the class participation was also an additional pressure so what did i do i kind of literally reinvented myself and this entire pandemic and the the time that i have spent teaching at this point i have become what i was consider a good lecturer of law and the reason why i did it was i found that we were recording the lectures so if you did a solid well researched lecture the student one gets you know like some solid stuff there two can read listen in again and as they listened in again sometimes the questions came in later but at least the whole experience was pakka you know you you talk and you don't do a lecture in one mechanical information manner you necessarily do an analytical lecture to do an analytical lecture means i was just telling a colleague that for a one hour lecture you had to put in some 7 8 hours of work because it needed to be the solid kind of thing that you're not just faffing you know you're not just which sometimes all of us do when we are doing offline classes but in an online class when you are having your lectures being recorded so i would say and this was my researcher's instinct that no if i keep teaching like i was teaching in the offline mode it won't work correct okay. and yeah please and my message as such the second part of your question is like be a good learner you can only be a good teacher if you are a good learner right. if you are all of the time willing to learn of all of the time willing to reinvent yourself willing to accept that maybe you didn't get something right so it's so only that which can allow you to do it if you think you have it all sorted you're finished <laughs> so professor dhanda as the head of uh, our academic committee while you have done an excellent job an outstanding job uh the allegation is that you brought down the discipline 
what do you understand by discipline see it's like i'll, I'll give you a analogy uh, when i teach administrative law and one of the very uh, overarching questions of administrative law is about whether you choose fairness or efficiency you know this this kind of uh, the way in which you are talking in terms of uh, looking at uh, what is good administrative law it will be said that good administrative law is that wherein fairness and you know like we we have to give up on natural justice or we have to give up on this one because it's counter efficient and professor bakshi has raised this question and i re i repeat it uh, to say to you that is can anything which is unfair be efficient because if it is unfair then you are necessarily going to keep protesting about it and if you're going to keep protesting about it that means it's going to drag on i have a similar kind of answer on the whole question of discipline my thing somewhere is and i definitely do irrespective of it maybe you know you'll get to know that much more as i move off from your academic administration that i believe that when you listen to students and you are on a constant kind of basis asking them what they require i'm not saying that you necessarily give it to them but at least you hear them then when you turn around and say that you jolly will behave and this is not acceptable you have the credibility to be asking for that otherwise all you are doing is if you're saying i brought down bullying yes i did if bullying is equal to discipline then it is not how i see it if you can't respect your students and you can't talk to them in that manner and you expect them to listen to you then the only thing that you have in your hand is the danda is the baton is the saying that if you don't do this i will do this that or the other to you my thing is that if we want to be commanding respect not demanding it then we have to listen to them right. the point i was making earlier that you know you can't be a good teacher if you are not a good learner i don't think you can be a good administrator if you are not a people's person if you don't listen to people right how why should they follow you if you won't listen to them so you brought in as uh, academic had number of changes how difficult it was to bring so many changes uh well i had a good vice chancellor <laughs> that helped a lot i i'm saying it with with responsibility and i'm not saying it because you're sitting before me i'm saying it with responsibility because it's not like the changes we brought in now we never tried at nalsar earlier but you can't make changes unless and until you have a team you can't make changes unless and until you are clear in your head ki this is what we want to do in the beginning there will be resistance in the beginning there will be disquiet but and there will be difficulties also you know it's not like everything will go uh, smoothly but if you are if you're clear that this is worth doing then you can do it i mean i can say this with you know like if you recollect the first faculty meetings we had they were really really very very trenchant affairs and people were unhappy because you had literally you know like when i turned the whole thing upside down but today my own colleagues are some of the biggest defenders of not just the elective system the tutorial system the fact that you know this the, the new things that we brought in are being uh, defended and advocated and lionized by people who were who very strongly opposed it at one point of time right and it just you stayed the course you know you stayed the course you knew what you were doing and more importantly at least i have been very comfortable with making mistakes i feel it's okay you know if you do things only then you make mistakes and i have no problem with apologizing i also feel you make a mistake you say sorry for it you you need to learn how to say sorry no one teaches us how to say sorry in like heart say not saying you know not saying a sorry saying hi i'm sorry but you know wherein you are defending yourself even before you have acknowledged what you're sorry about so i would say it was great fun and progressively we had more and more people joining in both in the early phases the students were totally with us not so much the faculty 
in the later phases, the faculty is as much with us as the students. The current batch of students are born into the system, so they don't see what's a great shakes. They feel this is this is what it's meant to be. The early batch of students, because they came in from a purely mandatory system into a robust elective system, they were so enthusiastic about it that if they had not been, possibly we could not have run it. But because they were, they kind of, and that's that's my point about, you know, the, the question that you were asking me about discipline. It's because we heard them and they supported the system in such a big way. They were naturally disciplined into the design was disciplining them. You didn't have to do anything else. Right. So, Professor Dhanda, uh, can you tell my viewers, uh, how did you manage pandemic in terms of classes? What kind of changes you brought in in the evaluation pattern? Okay. Uh, what we did basically was that, luckily for us, you know, and Nalsar has a system of evaluation where everything doesn't stand and fall with the last exam. So we, that is, I'm talking about the first part, you know, in, in March when suddenly the lockdown was declared and the semester was not over. The next semester, we could organize it a little bit more, uh, you know, in advance and stuff. But the semester, where we were suddenly kind of like, we, we had already done, you know, our one set of exams. We have a large amount of assignments. Then, because we have an elective system, our uh, evaluation is customized and tailored in every course differently. So, because of that, we were able to fulfill all of all the requirements without having to do, you know, uh, any major kind of changes we had like we had online exams also for the elective courses we didn't have it for the mandatory courses therein we looked at the mid-semester performance the performance in the, the project which is a major component of the evaluation and also we tried to work out this that we do not disadvantage people who maybe have not performed well in only this semester so we looked at their earlier performance and we looked at this performance and whichever was the better performance is what we allowed students to. The idea basically was the other thing I would say, Professor Mustafa, is that we administered with kindness. I know administrators are not meant to be kind and you believe that kindness and firmness are supposed to be opposed to each other. I don't think teachers should behave like teachers, not as administrators. No, I definitely do think that administration is is the one, you know, is one place where you individuate, where you, like, as a counter to adjudication, like when we make that distinction between legislation and adjudication, in legislation, we make rules for everybody. In adjudication, we individualize. As, uh, you know, like, as as law professors say, whatever regulations we make, we make them for everybody. It's only as administrators that we individualize. And to say that in a country as diverse as India, even in a national law school, everybody is at the same place, it's not true. And administrate, and if we are small, we have an opportunity to be able to individuate and let our students firstly experience justice for them to become any kind of soldiers of justice. If they have only experienced injustice, from where are they going to be advocating justice? Right. It's, so as administrators, if we are able to give them that uh, experience, I think we do good. So in when I'm saying to do it as with kindness, we try to bring in this, you know, like we said, we'll have tests and we will not do only at the end exams. We also did that if you miss a test, we will have a repeat test for everyone, whoever has missed it for reasons beyond their control. And we'll be like, you know, you'll be allowed to appear in that test uh, without uh, getting an R or something that we have, you know, like a, it's a repeat performance, which won't be done in that manner. We try to reach out and give people as much, if people who didn't have access to the net we saw that the materials reached them in pen drives. Uh, you know, we did recordings. We opted for a system which allows for people to phone in 
and they don't necessarily need to have uh, you know a stable internet connection to be able to listen into classes you try to recognize the diversity which is there and in the student body of the students hmm? pardon we also sent to many students we sent laptops yes absolutely from on the same rationale no because we recognize the fact that everybody is not on a level playing field you try to make the field as level as is possible and i definitely do think that our students stood by us and we've had our differences of opinion it's not like everything went hunky dory and but you did a back and forth with them you continued and you kept the dialogue alive if a student believes that if he writes or she writes a letter or an email to you and it will be responded to not necessarily agreed to but will be responded to how much of a difference that makes in creating a community uh, where you you don't have to go out because you know you will be looked out for within i think that's that's the way i would say it and integrity is of us was one of us will reply <laughs> that's true that's that is also part of the same this thing no it's not unnecessary not required see if you replied i would not if i did you would not it not there was not need but they knew that the administration is responding and i would somewhere say if you want to give me your your readers or your listeners i would say two words i would say one kindness and two responsiveness we were all of the time on the ball you know saying that no what is happening to you is our concern at least tell us what is happening to you or whatever we can do we will do if we can't we won't yeah i told the student you know every just demand will be accepted and no unjust demand will be conceded so professor danda what is this punitive imagination of universities you have been speaking on this subject <laughs> yeah i mean it goes back to that question you asked me that you know i have brought down the discipline at nals <laughs> I, i i was also told by one of my younger colleagues that i invest too much into administration and i should let up and the logic basically was that okay you are doing it but after you people are going to find it very hard so i had said that uh, well that's the other person's challenge this is the way i see it okay. punitive imagination i would say professor mustafa is is about the fact of where uh, you know you actually believe that students have some kind of subjects you have there whom you are required to bring in line and you are a good administrator only if you can kind of put your you know hand on their throat and suffocate them that's the way of you you're a good teacher if you kind of terrorize them <laughs> i some way do feel that when you see you you know for a fact that because of the kind of fees we have at the national law schools our general student comes in from a specific class right so our biggest diversity comes in with affirmative action right and if there and also we don't want to invest and we just want those students whom we are supposedly brought in with affirmative action to fall in line but we don't want to do anything in the system for them then i would say it is only a punitive imagination it's not an emancipatory imagination and right. it's an emancipatory imagination a university needs right. so thank you very much to sudhanda for finding time for us uh i'm sure your association uh, with nalsar now it's a life long association you will never retire uh, you will continue to lead us in research uh, all the very best uh, for your future endeavors and your health i think uh, you should take a break for a while uh, on 31st much i'm going on a retreat professor <laughs> <laughs> you must you must i'm taking a one month retreat from i really feel i need it so i have i'm planning for it and i'm going yeah yeah and i also want to take this opportunity of like uh, not just thanking you and my colleagues for like being there i mean in 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 the last uh, years that we have done so many things at nalsar so many of them have really really supported me so i want to take this opportunity to thank them but most of all i want to thank my students i really like the website you've mentioned at the beginning of the program has been one of my most overwhelming experiences and if i had maybe any regrets ever i think they all vanished with that website i felt that if i can earn this 
I don't need to regret anything. True. Thank you so very much. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for being able to, thank you know, to talk about things that very often one doesn't. Right, right. Thank you so much. Bye.